Paso. The appointed hour of 6:10, having been reached, I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Steve Judge. I'm chair of the Zoning Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. I hereby call this meeting to order. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 21 and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meetings are and the meetings are recorded and may be viewed on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. If you wish to comment, please wish to make a comment. Uh, indicate that by using the raised hand function when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the, the Zoning Board of Appeal Chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their time limit, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. In accordance with provisions of chap Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 48, in Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. We'll begin with the roll call of the regular members of the ZBA. Um, the Chair, Steve Judge, is here. Mr. Meadows? I see you're there. Um, Mr. Henry? Here. Mr. White? Here. And Mr. Sloviter? Here. Also in attendance tonight is Justina Williams, a planner for the town. Uh, we want to welcome her. This is her first uh, foray into the ZBA, and thank you very much for joining us and assisting us, and welcome. And Christine Brestrup, the planning director for the town. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38, specifically findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or to gather additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public comment. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon you uh, if you wish to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All comments and questions must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is where the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file the decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing for the variance to file the decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, roll call, uh, approval, consideration of minutes for May 23rd, public hearing, the public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-18, ASD Shootsbury MA Solar LLC. Request for a special permit under section 3.340 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 9.35 megawatt DC and a 4.4 megawatt AC ground mounted photovoltaic array spanning 41 acres on a 102 acre site with accompanying battery energy storage system at three parcels of land owned by WD Cowles Company, identified as map 9B, parcels 11 and 12, and map 9D, parcel 27 on Shootsbury Road, RO, Outlying Residence Zoning District. Frontage and access from the subject parcel lands is located between 187 
and 201 Shootsbury Road. This matter is continued from our hearing on uh, April 25th, 2024. We have a public meeting on ZBA FY 2005-00020. Peter Sylvan requests approval of a management plan under condition 21 of special permit ZBA FY 2005-00020 for proposed change in ownership. Cushman Market, 491 Pine Street, Map 6A, Parcel 39, RN Zoning District. After that, there's general pub public comment period on any matter not before the board tonight and other business not generally anticipated within the last 48 hours. The first order of business is, is consideration of the minutes from May 23rd, 2024. Has everybody on the board had a chance to review those minutes? I have to say that those minutes are incredibly full, <laughs> incredibly uh, complete and um, wonderful. So um, I think they're accurate and I think they're very, very fulsome. So um, I have no changes. Does any other board member have any suggested for changes? No. Great. So I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes from May 23rd. Uh, no, excuse me. The minutes, approval of minutes from May 23rd, 2024, correct? Right. Is there, is there such a motion? So moved. Second. I, I, I saw a slow bitter. Okay. So we got this moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? If not, a vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. The, mo the vote is five to nothing. The minutes are approved. Next order of business is a public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-18 ASD Shootsbury MA Solar LLC. Um, first thing I want to do is run through submissions that we've received. Those can be found in the uh, project, the draft project application report. There are a few that are, we've received since the April meeting. Some of those, those include a comparison of CSI and Powell and battery systems that was submitted on May 24th, 2024. Order of resource area delineation. Um, or, and a new ORAD issue on May 20th, 2024. Also a submission, um, I think that was it in terms of submissions from the applicant. Is there anything else, Chris, from the applicant? Are those the, the submissions that we received from them since the April meeting? Yes, that's it from the applicant. And then there's uh, we, there's a lot of there's a number of uh, public submissions as well. And what I'm going to do is read through the ones that we have, um, and I'm going to use the what's on the the website. Um, we've got a submission from Scott Cashin on Friday, May third. We've got a submission from Stacy McCullough, an email on Tuesday, April 30th. We have a submission from Jenny Kallick on Tuesday, May 7th. We have a submission from Charlotte Burns on Saturday, May 18th. We have a submission from Jacob Hirsch on Monday, June 3rd. We have a submission from John Root on Sunday, June 2nd. We have a submission from the Town of Pelham Planning Board. Um, I don't think there's a date. Yes, April 30th. And we have a submission from Michael Lipinski on June 3rd. We have a submission that's, I don't think is connected to the Lipinski um, I don't know if this is connected to the Lipinski comment, but data from three best Shootsbury Roads narratives so far, undated, but it's in our, our public comments. I guess it is from Mr. Lipinski. I see that now at the end of it. Yep. We have um, also another submission from Mr. Lipinski, which is a project. It's a long 
uh, near, a long comment on um, a chart with various uh, responses to various um, assertions from the applicant. And that's it that I have as public comments at this point. I do want to say that um, we've had a number of application of a number of public comments in the last 24 hours. And it's really hard for those all to get put into the public comment file and for for us to review them prior to the the um, prior to the ZBA meeting, especially if they come in on the day of the meeting. So I so there are additional comments that have been made that I know the staff has that we don't have that we'll be able to review before the next meeting, but they came in too late for us to be able to to put them into the public folder and for for us to have them before the meeting. So please be assured that we read all your comments. We know the comments come in. We just did. It would be really helpful for comments to come in two days before the the meeting. That way, it gives the staff a chance to put it into the public folder and to distribute those for us to read. It's really difficult. Um, there's 41 pages of comments that came in uh, recently, and it's just difficult for us to get to all of that uh, on the day of the hearing. So um, please note any comments that I did not mention will be uh, read and be noted for the next meeting. Chris, is there anything else that you want? I noticed your hand was up. Is there, did I miss a submission? No, I just wanted to say just what you said. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so the next order of business is to, um, it was just for me to say what I think that the hearing, how I'm gonna conduct the hearing tonight. Um, we have two matters on the agenda. There's a lot of public comment and a lot of people I think that would be interested in, in speaking tonight. My goal is to complete this, number one, we're gonna have our traditional break at, um, at 7.30 for five minutes. And my goal is to try to end this, the discussion, or continue the discussion to a later point in time on the solar project between 8 and 8.15 to make sure we have enough time to get to the second matter. We will end the meeting by 9 o'clock tonight. So um, if that's okay with the board members, I'll proceed to the meeting. Um, who's representing the applicant tonight? Tom Reedy is representing the applicant and also Corey McCandless from Pure Sky Energy. Okay. Mr. Reedy and Mr. McCandless, uh, please identify yourself for the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Members of the board, I'm Tom Reedy. I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson in Amherst, 6 Southeast Street. Great, thank you. Mr. McCandless, or Ms. McCandless, excuse me. Yes, hi, good evening. Uh, Karina McCandless, um, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Reedy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. Good to see everyone. So last we were here in, in April, we had slated this date uh, really as a check in or an update. Um, just to somewhat as the chair had mentioned to to go through what's happened since the April meeting and then to get a sense of where the town is as far as the uh, peer review and then to pick a date to continue the hearing to. So frankly, we don't expect any substantive discussion. We're happy to listen. We did get all the material. Ms. Brestrup sent us over a link to the folder. Uh, candidly, I have not had the opportunity to review all of it, uh, but we will. We always take a look at it. And so just because we haven't done it before the meeting doesn't mean we're not going to do it. Um, so where have we been? Uh, we were here April 25th. Subsequently, I think it was May 8th, we were in front of the Conservation Commission. They issued an order of resource area delineation. Um, we had also then submitted uh, our, our updated plans to the wetlands administrator for comment. Uh, she did a really terrific and thorough job uh, of reviewing them, brought up some really great points. Uh, we got that letter, I think, May 30th. So we're working through those comments and our responses to it. My understanding is that, uh, and I'll lean on Ms. Brestrup a little bit for these two items, but the first piece is gonna be WSP and their review of the battery energy storage and the glare. Uh, they're the peer reviewers. Uh, we had submitted some information switching from Powin to Canadian Solar, and that has been provided, I believe, to WSP. And then the last piece is just a check-in on the uh, request for uh, proposals from potential peer reviewers. 
and just where that stands. We've obviously, we've been out of the process, um, not meddling in it at all. So we're using this as an opportunity to check in. And then finally, just a, a request to continue to July 25th, I think is the, I don't think the first July date makes sense. I think probably the second July date, which I believe to be July 25th for the board to continue to that date. So um, that's our update. If Ms. Brestrup has anything on the peer reviewers, we'd, we'd love to hear it. Ms. Brestrup? Yes, good evening. Um, I did uh, forward a request for um, a scope of services and a request to uh, send out an RFQ to peer reviewers. Um, and I sent that to our, uh, our, I forget what she's called, I'm sorry, Simone Cristoforo, who um, solicits bids for us. I don't know what her exact title is, but in any event, I can read to you um, essentially what we said. Um, there's a description of the project and the scope of services includes um, the selected firm will review all relevant materials that have been submitted to the ZBA during the special permit hearing process as of the date of June 6th, 2024, and any subsequent updates that are submitted and provide third party findings in the following topics, site design and overall layout. An updated site plan has been submitted by the applicant dated April 17th, 2024. I can send this document around to everybody. Construction phasing, um, and there are two topics there, tree removal plan and phase A and B of construction. Then the next topic is impact to wetlands. The project is currently under review by the Conservation Commission with regard to wetland delineation. An ORED has been issued and site plans are under review by the wetlands administrator. Actually, she did submit comments, so we have those comments. It's expected that a notice of intent will be filed within the next two months, probably sooner than that, as soon as um, the applicant can make uh, the changes that are requested by the wetlands administrator. And then review of the notice of intent um, would be included um, in the third party review for the CBA. Uh, we'd expect a report um, from them on that. And they will also receive report a report and data from the Conservation Commission um, when we receive that. Um, the, the, we want the peer reviewer to review stormwater management, um, both during construction, including erosion and sedimentation control, and evaluation of the SWIP, um, and also post-construction evaluation of stormwater management and performance plan. We want the peer reviewer to review impacts to water quality, which would include potential groundwater contamination from on-site battery energy storage system, potential contamination from the construction phase of the project, potential impact on neighboring wells, potential impact on neighboring geothermal heating sources, potential impact on nearby surface water streams, including Adams Brook, potential impacts, including the following, all chemical applications proposed on the site as part of the site preparation and construction activities. Examples include chemicals used for dust suppression, herbicides used to establish pollinator meadow, et cetera. Chemical applications associated with permanent long run operations and maintenance, solvents used to clean the panels, de-icing materials, herbicides, and fertilizers and review of the manufacturer's specifications for any and all equipment or materials being installed on site that contain toxic or hazardous elements, that is battery, batteries, electronical equipment, generators, transformers, et cetera. Um, then we tell them where they can find all this material. Um, we offer them a site visit if they are so inclined. Um, and then we require a uh, a summarized report of findings, and we require them to attend a meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And then there are um, some additional statements about what we need from them in order to be able to evaluate their proposal. So I will send this to the ZBA members and we'll post this on the, um, on the website for this project. And uh, just, I, I also wanted to say that the person who is helping us with this, um, you know, Amherst is a very busy town and she has a few things that are um, 
stacked up in front of this. So hopefully she'll get this out in the next few days. But um, that, that's the status of the of the peer review for those other topics besides, um, I think it was Tom had mentioned uh, WSP, who is a consultant, and they are currently under contract to review a glare study and also to review the battery energy storage system. So, um, so that's that's on its way, and they have received the latest information from um, Pure Sky about the comparison of the Canadian solar batteries with the Powan batteries. So, to summarize, I guess we have one peer review that's in process, and then we have a, a request. We will soon have a request for proposal out for a, a larger peer review, a, a more comprehensive peer review. Is that that's correct? right. Yes. And what is the what will we know by July twenty fifth? If that if that's when we meet next, will we any, may. Will, we may have the first one back by then? I don't know if we'll have the first one back because they may need to look at other things that are going to be submitted. You know, we're, the applicant is going through a conservation process, a notice of intent, and we don't know what kinds of things are going to be changing. Um, we don't necessarily want them to be doing their work twice. So um, we'll see what they can do, you know, prior to uh, having any kind of um, review by the Conservation Commission. Um, and you asked if we would know anything more by July 25th, and I think we would hope that we would have someone under contract to do the other part of the peer review of those topics that I listed tonight. Okay. Well, just one editorial comment. I did read most of the uh, wetlands administrators report. It was comprehensive to say the least, and it was, uh, I was impressed with it. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of suggestions and suggested changes contained in that, or at least a lot of requests for information and also some, some proposed changes that I think warrant uh, real con consideration by the applicant. But I was impressed with what um, Ms. Uh, Aaron Jack has put together. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, any other any other comments from either Mr. Reedy or Ms. McCandless? No, Mr. Chair, that was very helpful. Thank you, Ms. Brestrup. Yep. Any questions from members of the board for the applicant? All right. Um, if there's no questions from members of the board and there's no further questions or no further comments from the applicant, it's time for public comment. I would, I would say two things. Number one, this is going to be a long process. Uh, we're going to have lots of meetings, several more meetings for sure on this topic. Um, so this is not your only chance to have public comment, but I can see that there's a large number of participants and people who are, who wish to speak. And so, we're going to start public comment. Um, public comment is um, is if you wish to comment, indicate by raising the by using the raised hand function on Zoom or by pressing star nine on your phone. When you recognize the staff will help to rec and the, will help the chair in recognizing people who wish to speak. When you are recognized, please give your name and address for the record, and um, I will uh, ask you to keep your comments to about three minutes. I will try to assist you in, to, in following that admonition by starting my own uh, timer and uh, we'll do our best to keep everybody on, on track here. So, and one last thing, all comments should be directed, please direct the comments to the board, not to the applicant or not to any individual. So who's the, Jacinta, who's the first person we have up? Bill Rich. Okay, are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Can you give us your name and address, please? Yep. Phil Rich, 187 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. All right, Mr. Rich, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I had submitted a comment about two days ago uh, or three days ago, and I also used the, I sent to Ms. Brestrup, and I also used the, the comment page uh, on the website. Anyway, I'm going to just read that comment now, as, as it didn't seem to make it in. <clears throat> so excuse me for reading it. That's but okay. It said, okay. Aside from my general concerns about clear cutting active uh, forest land in order to put in a commercial solar installation, I first want to be clear about the direct impact 
the proposed installation will have on me as an immediate abutter to the proposed installation, as well as all other abutters. If the project is authorized by the town, significant impacts to my property, property will be felt as soon as work begins on the construction access road, which literally begins by my mailbox and runs along the entire length of my property, not more than 200 feet from my home. As the land, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, below the proposed installation, sorry, as the ancient root systems in that access road are disrupted and impaired, so too will be the capacity of the soil to absorb water. Instead, runoff water, sediment will run downhill directly onto my property, causing flooding, erosion, and general damage to my gardens, lawn, and driveway, not to mention the possibility of overwhelming my foundation drain and causing flooding in my basement. Indeed, that's already the case uh, that excess water, excess water flowing down the road has caused damage to my flower beds, to my soil, to my driveway. And just a year ago, my basement flooded. That's before this. Uh, the destruction of the existing access road as widening and resurfacing um, is, um, and its subsequent use of multiple heavy duty uh, vehicles, presumably for days and weeks and months on end as the construction is going on. Um, they're only going to ensure further uh, and more significant damage to my property um, and risk further flooding to my home. And this is, of course, in addition to the removal of over 40 acres of trees, thick vegetation and root systems, which will no longer be there to drink in rainfall and other groundwater. And again, almost certainly ensure significant water runoff right down the hill to my home and all the homes and land below me as Shootsbury Road continues downhill past my home. In addition to flooding, soil erosion, property damage, there's a real risk to the watershed that feeds the wells of oil abutters who are not otherwise on town water and depend on our wells for safe utility and drinking water. The watershed and aquifer may become contaminated or otherwise damaged by the construction process and the process of continuing operation of an industrial installation on top of the destruction of forest land in order to um, build and operate a commercial installation there's the noise pollution that's going to be caused by months of construction with uh, all those trucks running several hundred feet at most from my home and the lack of privacy that goes along with that. This noise pollution is in addition to any constant harm or tone produced by the solar installation itself once in operation. Let me also note the risk of fire and other damage resulting from damaged or defective batteries as a already known risk Further, the constant use of heavy duty vehicles during construction will not only significantly degrade the forest itself, but also cause damage to an already poorly maintained Shootsbury Road. And of course, the green space of this area will be replaced by an industrial energy plant. In addition, as a direct result of having an industrial complex built quite literally next to our homes, there's the question of reductions in the property values of abutting homes almost guaranteed in my case, as I'll have a 15 foot gravel utility road starting at my mailbox, not 200 feet from my drive, uh, 20 feet, excuse me, from my drive and running on it for my property. Regarding my other concerns, regardless of whether there are any homes in the area at all, my first concern is the construction of environmentally friendly and vital forest land, rather than using already, excuse me, already used or distressed land in order to reduce our carbon footprint. Untouched forest land, and wetland sites are essential for lots of different reasons, including carbon sequestration, providing habitat for wildlife and plants, preventing flooding and contributing to clean air and water in general. Removing forest and, um, and land threatens biodiversity and habitat and increases vulnerability to flooding, erosion, and further environmental impact and decline. Further, Mr. Can you sum up? Yeah, my sum is the very last thing. In sum, I hope the various town councils and groups involved in this proposal, and perhaps especially the ZBA, will take into primary consideration not just the preservation and stewardship of forest lands, but the health, the well-being, the safety, and the wishes of town residents, and especially those of us who are really direct about us to the property. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rich. Um, a, a comment from for me, I had failed. You had submitted this. It's in the folder. I had failed to scroll down far enough. And I recognized uh, your comment. I was familiar with it when you started to speak. So I, I see it's there. We received your comment on Monday, June 3rd. Um, and I, I recognized um, your comment from that. I also had one other comment that 
Uh, for the record, we did receive, we got a, a, a comment from Janet McGowan uh, dated June 5th, 2024. So um, you put, please put that in the record, Jacinta, that we that I noted those comments. And, and thanks for acknowledging that. Thank you. Yep, it's there. And I, I, I recognize what uh, your statement when you began. So I apologize. Uh, let's go to the next commenter. Um, just seems like we have Stacy. Yes, hi, this is Stacy McCullough, uh, 26 North Valley Road in Pelham. I did submit a comment, which you acknowledged. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I am not going to read the entire comment, but I would like to emphasize uh, one part of it because I know it's easy for details to get lost in the heaps of um, submissions and studies that you're being referred to. Um, I am concerned about the project being appropriate for this site. Uh, I think it's easy to wonder when people say that, whether it's just NIMBYism um, and solar does need to go somewhere. We need solar to make our energy goals. And the question is, is this the somewhere where it should go? There have been uh, substantial extended studies to address that question. And the answer has come back a really clear and resounding, no, it does not need to go in sites like this. In particular, the, te the technical potential of, of solar study that was conducted for the Mass Department of Energy Resources assessed solar sites on six categories, four of them environmental and two of them feasibility, like is it near electricity infrastructure? And they determined that for our climate goals, we need 24 to 31 additional gigawatts of solar. We need those to go somewhere. And luckily, what they found out is that if you only look at the sites that are rated highly suitable in every one of those six categories, we have enough room for 152 gigawatts, potentially. So five or six times the 24 to 31 gigawatts that we need to add. This site that's being considered received the lowest suitability mark, a C, in two of those six categories, biodiversity, and embedded carbon dioxide. So yes, it is a good place feasibility-wise for companies to make a good profit on a solar installation, but it is a really terrible place environmentally for this kind of an installation. And I really urge you as a board to think about, yes, we do need solar and where can we support that without choosing places that are highly unsuitable in terms of biodiversity and embedded carbon dioxide being that the studies have shown that there's plenty of that land around. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I think our next commenter is uh, Mr. Jacob Hirsch. Hello, my name is uh, Jack Hirsch. I live at 400 Flathills Road. So I am a semi abutter. Um, this property is zoned residential, and it strikes me that there needs to be uh, a pretty high bar to allow an industrial grade power plant to be sited in a residential area. One of the things that really concerns me that hasn't been discussed is the amount of pollution that's actually gonna be caused and affect the local residents while they're doing the construction. I assume all the inst all the uh, construction vehicles and equipment will be fossil fuel burning things, mostly diesel, uh, diesel, but probably gasoline and maybe propane. Um, all of those things are going to be polluting the environment. Um, the trucks are going to be driving all around our neighborhood, um, and those will certainly be diesel, and those are quite polluting. <clears throat> If you read what's uh, in diesel pollution, it's particulate, which is, you know, causes lung cancer. <clears throat> it's also uh, um, gases that promote global warming. And it's also volatile organic um, got, uh, compounds, which will um, not only cause cancer, but settle down into the water and further pollute our water resources. So I hope all of those things are considered. And I would hope that maybe um, one of the consultants can do a study to see how much pollution 
in our groundwater and in our air would result just from the construction. Um, I also um, find that all of the residential roads around there are not really suitable for heavy construction trucks and especially carrying timbers away. So I would like to see what the plan is for access and egress and um, for removing material from that lot. Thank you very much. I appreciate your efforts. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Um, the next person is uh, Ms. Lenore Brick. Hi. Um, my name is Lenore Brick. I live at 255 Strong Street, Amherst, and I also am uh, the co-founder of uh, the Regional Farming, Forest, and Food Systems Group of Climate Action Now. And that's the regional context that I would like to comment on that focuses on the fundamental purpose of solar installations and how this is actually out of sync. Um, just one, it's, it's really actually one point that I wanna make, that if, if there was a holistic regional plan so that the state partnered with towns to wisely address the climate crisis and biodiversity collapse we're in, that was truly more informed by the latest climate science, including understanding the natural systems that have always regulated the climate, the impacts on ecosystems, ecology, and water cycles, that included subsidizing land stewards to protect and regenerate their land, not simply sell, off, sell it off for their understandable financial security, to provide renewable energy providers so they can build more easily on built landscapes. If the state wasn't playing catch up, tethered by archaic legislation, policy and dysfunction, and towns were supported to contribute what they are best suited to, in Western Mass, our contribution could be protecting our green lands. This wouldn't fall so heavily on you, a small town board to weigh all the complex pros and cons in order to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our town, but it does. So we're asking that you be guided by the wisdom, the common sense embodied in the phrase, first do no harm, which is the precautionary principle, because we can always add another solar installation when we're sure that that is the only choice we have but we cannot replace the forests or ecosystems once we destroy them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brick. Um, I know we have a, a Renee Moss next. Let's promote her to uh, yeah. speak. Yes, sure. hello. Good evening, can you, can you hear me? We sure can, yes. Hi, uh, Renee Moss, uh, 277 Shrewsbury Road. And I'm actually, um, kind of representing Judith Eisman tonight, who's the chair of the town of um, Pelham planning board. And she was unable to be here. So I said I would read her letter. I know they submitted a letter. I believe you said it was April 30th, but they submitted one as of June 5th, as of today. So that probably didn't get into your packet. So I just share this, okay? So the Amherst ZBA has the opportunity to set an example by recognizing the work of the state's commission on energy, infrastructure, siting, and permitting, as well as the common knowledge that trees are a public good. The latter is a position taken by, cl by climate researchers across the Commonwealth. A careful review of the report and recommendations should lead the ZBA to conclude that permitting this project will put the onus on the Amherst Conservation Commission and uh, Department of Environmental Protection to undertake a lengthy permitting process that wastes time and money for everyone involved. Michael Judge, the EEOA Undersecretary of Energy explained in a forum this week, that in accordance with the commission's recommendations, standards and regulations for solar siting will soon be set by state agencies. This site will obviously fail to meet anything currently being discussed. Acknowledging that this site is inappropriate for the clear cut and proposed solar development would assure the public that the ZBA understands that the proposed project does not help meet energy or environmental goals. If environmental damage is avoided, no one will have to engage in remediation, difficult or impossible once the area is irretrievably altered. 
The environmentally and economically responsive action is to withhold the permit because the costs are too great for the town and the region. Thank you for your attention to this and to previous comments from the board. And that's from Judy Eisman on behalf of the board, the planning board of Pelham. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Uh, I think we have uh, Karen Utkoff requesting to, to speak. Please give your give us your name and address for the record. Karen Utgoff, 176 Shootsbury Road, uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. I am directly across from the Access Road and 187 uh, Shootsbury Road. Uh, I submitted a comment last night and I will, uh, uh, and I expect it didn't get into the packet, but I'd like to read just a brief portion of it. Um, this very large scale and unprecedented for Amherst solar project poses risks that exceed the potential benefits. At best, its development will forever sacrifice the ecosystem services provided by the land in its current state and significantly disrupt a neighborhood of quiet homes to which the town does not provide drinking water, sewer services, or streetlights. It, the energy generated will not directly reduce the carbon footprint of the town or its residents. If the project falls short of this best case, risks include problems that may be too co costly or impossible to fix, resulting in long-term environmental and economic damage. Many of the speakers have already addressed this. For example, well and septic system failures, flooding, which would not be surprising given the unprecedented uh, rainstorms that are now driven by uh, climate change, uh, erosion uh, that would negatively impact uh, the health, safety, welfare, and economic well-being of the neighborhood, and perhaps the entire town if the town ends up bearing the costs. Um, my letter goes on, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Utgolf. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Uh, I see that Mr. Lipinski has his hand up. Hi, I'm Mike Lipinski, 167 Shootsbury Road, Amherst. Um, just, just have a few things to talk about. Um, one is some new information that became available to me this week about the project, which hadn't been revealed before. I um, got in contact with Pierce Guy about how many trees would actually be taken down for this project. They've never really mentioned that. They've mentioned the acreage, but not how many trees. And I did get an estimate, which is a combined estimate from uh, Corey and from Coles. And basically they're saying 6,000 trees that are five inches in diameter at breast height would be taken down for this project. That's 6,000 trees, five inches or larger. That does not count all the immature trees and brush and everything else that would be taken out by the grubbing that would take place. So it gives you a sense of just how much environmental damage would be done. It's ironic in this town where I see people fighting about a single tree on the side of the road or preserving a single tree for someone's garage and having to put up an argument about preserving that one tree this project will be taken down over 6,000 of them. Another um, thing which came up this week, which I thought was interesting, is I, I tried to actually make sense of what's going on with the batteries. And so I've provided you with a chart and it'd be easier to, to follow the chart, but I'll try to explain my way through it. So far, there's been three different battery energy storage proposals, narratives that have been put out. The first one called for 27 Poen centipede batteries. It would store 20 megawatt hours. The actual hours of storage would be four hours. That plan was scrapped in October 23rd. And instead of 27 of those batteries, it shrunk down to 12. And instead of four hours of storage, it's two hours of storage. Another proposal came out in March. This time, to switch battery companies completely, 
And instead of 27 batteries or 12 batteries, it's four batteries with a total amount of storage of 10.309 megawatts. I put their mistake in, there's supposed to be a decimal point there, but there's a lot of sloppiness and a lot of the work they put out. So I put their actual number, but it should be 10.309 megawatts for a total of two hours storage. So this brings me to the question of the battery storage for the project has shrunk by at least 50%, but the project itself hasn't shrunk at all. In other words, the first version called for four hours of battery storage. The last two versions call for two hours of battery storage, but the overall amount of solar panel coverage has not changed at all. So they initially had a project they felt confident could provide electricity that would go out to the, to go out to the grid, but would also be able to be stored in huge amounts, but they've reduced that, but they haven't changed the amount of solar panels. So there's a discrepancy there that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It seems like if you reduce the battery storage, you should re be reducing the amount of panels also. Perhaps one of their engineers can explain that at some point, maybe we'll see them again. But to me, that's a pretty big deal. If you're going to change the battery storage, why aren't you changing the number of panels? It seems like the original plan was overbuilt enough that they had enough electricity to store four hours worth in a giant batteries. Now they're storing half that amount. So why aren't the number of solar panels being reduced to correspond with that change? I'll just leave it at that. Uh, one, <clears throat> one, last, one last detail. I also noticed that the original batteries were air-cooled and the new battery is now liquid cooled. It's hard to find any information on just what that liquid is. So I would be concerned on what that liquid is and whether it's toxic or not. So those All are right. just some things to look into. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Thank you. Um, I see that we have Ms. Weiserbaum, Weisenbaum. Yes, thank you. This is Sharon Weisenbaum. 86 Henry Street in Amherst. And I would like to comment on something that came up at a previous meeting where a representative from Pure Sky said that the reason that the uh, project had to be in this area was because of the location of the electrical substations and that putting the project somewhere else, like on a parking lot in Hadley was too expensive, that it would be too expensive. And that, that really struck me because I'm thinking of the players in this project. There's Pure Sky and there's Eversource and there's Coles Lumber. And then there are the residents that are directly affected, the residents in Amherst. And of all of these players, the least wealthy are the residents in Amherst. And so why are the residents of Amherst being asked to pay the price in our uh, water safety, in our home values, when these companies are so wealthy like why not build new substations when you're the one with so much money and we aren't. So we're being asked to pay the price because of these major for-profit industries. So that just really struck me and that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. We Ms. Weisenbaum. I see no other hands at presently um, from people who wish to speak. There's one phone in call. Listener, can you bring that person? In? Does that person wish to speak? Can you tell Jacinta? 
I've asked them to unmute, but maybe they don't know. It's star six um, to the individual on the phone. If you would like to unmute and speak, it's star six. I think it's actually star nine. Star nine? Yeah. Okay. Here, it, here it's star nine. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello? Yeah, can you hear we me? can hear you. Please give us your name and, and address. Hi. Yeah, I'm Lori Goldner at 111 Albanwood Road in Amherst. Um, sorry, I was out walking the dog, so I wanted to call in. I'm mostly trying to hear what people are saying because I personally have a hard time understanding how putting in a solar farm is worse than the logging that will inevitably happen on that land. Um, and that happened already on the land north of Shutesbury Road. I mean, it's all horrible. I don't approve of any of it, but uh, we need solar. And um, I, I, as long as people's property values and health is protected, uh, we really need solar. Any rate, I just thought I'd throw that in there. I know it's not a popular opinion at this meeting. Um, I will send a, for a more substantial comment um, later. But, um, you know, that's a question I would like to answer, answer it is, well, okay. Um, you know, the whole, coal, the whole property, pr private property north of that, that, that section of Shutesbury Road was recently logged, and it looks like uh, Mars. And um, what sort of impact is that having on people? And how is that going to be, uh, how is this going to be any worse than that? Anyway, thanks for listening and for working on this and for all the comments. Thank you for your comment. Any other people who wish to speak? So, in, so indicate by raising the uh, using the raised hand function. All right. I think that's all we have for um, public comments. This is an opportunity for the um, applicant to respond to public comments if they wish. I don't think we have to respond to anything at this point, Mr. Chair. We'll just wait, address it comprehensively, and and wait for some of those peer reviews to come back. But we appreciate everybody's comments. Great. Okay. And um, also an opportunity if the board has any question, any member of the board has questions. I think I'll go. I see you have one, Mr. Henry. But Ms. Brestrup, is there some uh, procedural thing we have to do here that I'm missing? I just wanted to say that um, I had an exchange, an email exchange with one of the board members today, and um, we thought together that it might be useful to have KP Law come and talk to the Zoning Board of Appeals about the status of um, solar in Massachusetts, um, because there is Section 3 of um, Chapter 40A that limits how much um, cities and towns can regulate or limit solar installations. So getting a little bit of a sense of um, what that's all about might be helpful. And if the person who uh, exchanged email with me wants to say any more, please do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henry. I think I heard Mr. Meadows. Maybe he's the one that emailed Ms. Bestrop. Yes, yep. I did. Okay. Uh, my suggestion request was that we have somebody from one of the town attorneys come and make a presentation to the board and to the public as we had some months ago so that it will refresh our memory uh, as to what the abilities and limitations are of the ZBA and will also allow the public to understand what limitations we're working under so that they don't misinterpret whatever action we take. Good suggestion. So Ms. Brestrup, you made the request to KP and we will have that, I think it's a great idea and we will have that scheduled for one of our upcoming meetings. I haven't actually made the request yet. I wanted to get your sense of um, of that, Mr. Judge. So if you um, authorize us to contact KP Law, we'll do that and see if they can come to one of your upcoming meetings. Good. I'm for it. Okay. Support. I think understanding of the state law limitations is important, as well as limitations and requirements. Good. Uh, Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I had the opportunity to read um, 
one of the reports that was cited by Ms. McCullough from Pelham, um, from the Division of Energy Resources. And I just want to understand if the applicants had had a chance to review um, that report based on the study that was done by Harvard, the Audubon Society, and the Commonwealth. Is that a question to us, Mr. Henry? It is. Is that that is that that technical feasibility study? Is that the one you're talking it, about? It is, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can... I think fundamentally the study has some um, inaccuracies with it as far as the land that the study uh, identifies as potentially suitable and what that ultimately means. Uh, and that what I'm trying to say is that there's land that we know to be unde undevelopable through one program or another, whether it's a, a conservation restriction or otherwise, that is not uh, considered in that study. And so what that means is they thought it was developable when it's not developable. And so just somewhat facially and fundamentally, there's some flaws and inaccuracies in, in that study. Um, we can get into it a little bit more. I don't frankly feel comfortable at this point to have a substantive discussion about it, but if it's something that you'd like us, and if you want to expound on your question so we can get into the nitty gritty to say, okay, here's what you're looking for, we can certainly do that. We're not trying to shy away from anything, but just somewhat surficially, you know, when we see that understanding that, you know, frankly, we've, so WD Coles is a client of mine. We took a look at that. We took a look at other lands at WD Coles. We said, well, this is funny because Coles has already preserved 5,000 acres of forest land. And it said that it's appropriate to be developed. And so that's, it, it threw up a little bit of a red flag for us as far as the quality of that study. Um, but if there's other parts of it that you'd like to us to talk about, we're happy to do it. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Um, I, I will continue to read because I just read the executive summary, but it's a very detailed report that I think is actually very interesting. So if I do have follow-up questions, I will raise them at our next meeting. Thank you. Ms. Presto. Um, Yeah, I'd just like to offer this thought that um, when... Um, when a solar installer is considering property to be developed for solar installations, there has to be an agreement between the landowner and the company. And so all of the land that could possibly be developed for solar installations in Massachusetts is not really, in fact, available because some owners won't want to use their property for solar installations. They may want to use their property for housing development or a shopping center or preserving the trees or who knows what, but each individual property owner has his own idea of what he wants to use his property for. And not all of the properties that are um, considered to be feasible for solar are actually possible for solar because they're owned by individuals who have their own ideas about what to use their property for. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there are no further comments or questions for the applicant. I think, uh, I, I think I have one more, Mr. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So, um, and, and I know I cannot reply to the public comments, but there's a gentleman who talked about um, his property being flooded, you know, as as is. And his concern was um, this project could potentially increase um, damage and impact to um, the property. Because, again, where this project is going to go, I mean, his driveway sits almost immediately next, if I heard correctly, to where the work is going to begin. What safeguards um, are is Pierce Sky going to put in place to, you know, minimize any damage while the work is being done? I think that's part of the big concern here is that there's going to be a lot of construction, tree cutting, trucks moving in, you know. So can you guys just provide something that um, any safeguards while this construction is happening? Yes, absolutely. And and so, I mean, we're acutely aware of 
um, the different phases of this project, right? There's this permitting phase. There's a pre-construction phase. I don't know what all that is behind me. Um, <laughs> Fireworks. <laughs> all, of a, all of a sudden, you have the 4th of July behind you. Mr. <laughs> was, I, I, I don't think that's you fair. You know, <laughs> the rest of us can't do that. <laughs> I don't want to break the fourth wall, but that was incredible. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, to get back on track. Yeah, and then there's the... I mean, the construction phase and within that construction phase, there are many phases, right? So it's something that that probably out of the entire project is the piece that we're paying most attention to, right? And so it's the tree clearing. It's the pre-construction. It's setting up erosion and sedimentation controls. Um, and then it's the phasing of the construction and the sequencing of the construction at different times of year, depending upon when the approval gets uh, you know, assuming we get an approval when that happens and then when the project actually begins. And so after that, then it's this kind of post-development stabilization phase. So we're looking at each of these discreetly to make sure that we do address exactly what that, that a butter had said. And so pretty simply and somewhat broadly, erosion and sedimentation control will certainly be, it is certainly a part of um, what we're providing. And then in addition, you know, the, the, what I heard Ms. Brestrup say as far as the peer review is concerned is that they are looking pretty specifically at one of those, uh, you know, the construction phasing, the tree clearing, the stormwater, stormwater, not only over land, but also groundwater and its impact. So not only are we providing things and we're comfortable with what we're providing, not only is uh, Ms. Jacques looking at that and making comments, but we'll also have a peer reviewer. So we're having like three layers of protection. And I, I believe... Um, you know, a, a condition that we would be uh, amenable to if we were approved is to have a construction monitor on site, assume, you know, if there's a certain amount of rainfall to make sure that the erosion and sediment control is doing what it should be doing. And so, I mean, we can get into all the actual methods and practice that, you know, we're going to employ. We can start now. I think it's probably more appropriate to have a more comprehensive discussion, but kind of simply and also long-windedly. Yes, we've got a plan in place and that's what we're looking to do. So if, if I hear you correctly, um, what you guys are proposing to do, people's properties nearby will be protected um, during, during this construction process. During construction and then once it's uh, constructed and as stabilized, yes. Thank you. And I think one of the things that's important is what Mr. Reedy said is that there are other people than just uh, the applicant that are providing what they think is the appropriate plan. It's going to be reviewed by um, a, the peer reviewer as well as the Conservation Commission. So it's not just in the plan, I guess. So we'll have a chance to, to see if the plan is, is in, your, in our view, adequate. And we'll have some other uh, comparisons to with which we can put against the plan that they propose. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, before we move on to uh, continuing this hearing to July 25th was a date suggested by the by Mr. Reedy. I want to make sure that that's a date that is available to all members of the ZBA. So can you pull out your calendars and see if July 25th is a date that will be available? It looks like I'm currently, I'm available on the 25th. Mr. Solviter? Currently, I am available on the 25th. Mr. Henry? I think I'm available as well. <laughs> Mr. Meadows? I believe I am. I have actually I have ZBA on my calendar. Yes, <laughs> I did too. <laughs> All right. So I would entertain a motion that we continue this matter until July 25th <laughs> at 6 p.m. I so moved. So moved, Mr. Chair. And seconded. I heard two voices, so it's moved and seconded. Any discussion? 
If not, the vote occurs on the motion to continue the hearing in the public hearing until July 22nd at July 25th at 6 p.m. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. The vote is four to nothing. The, the motion passes. Thank you very much. See you guys in a month and a half. Uh, the next order of business is ZDA FY 2005 Peter Sylvan requests approval of a management plan under condition 21 of special permit ZDA FY 20. 20500020 for proposed change in ownership at Cushman Market, 491 Pine Street, Map 6A, Parcel 39, RN Zoning District. Is Mr. Sylvan, Mr. Sloboder? Since we are ahead of your the schedule you announced at the beginning yep. and, and closing in on your traditional 7.30, five-minute break, yes. could, perhaps we could take the five-minute break now and then when we resume, we can get into this and not have to interrupt the the agenda item we're about to start on. I think that makes great sense. Well, thank you. We'll do that. I think okay. we'll do that. And that, that way we can make sure that Mr. Sylvan is on the call on the, the Zoom, because I don't see him on yeah. the he may He may feel sneaked up on it this early. <laughs> yeah. No one anticipated it'd be done this early. So Right. Um, so I think that's a good, we'll, we'll do that in just a second. Ms. Brestrup, you had your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to say that Tom Reedy is going to represent um, Mr. Sylvan tonight, and he is here. So he's here, as, okay. Yes, so that's, that's. Well, I still think that Mr. Slobiter's suggestion is a good one. We'll take five minutes, um, and then we'll be right back. So uh, it's 7.18, we'll come back about, uh, 725. Thank you.
Chair Judge, it looks like there is an individual with their hand up. Yeah, I, I, I see that. Um, but we're not, this is a public meeting and it's not typically okay. time for public comment. So I suspect that's, that may just be a hand up from before, but. Sure. So yeah. that's, if I could, so. That's Frida Peters. Frida is actually the purchaser of uh, Cushman Market. So, okay. If, if Thank you, you wanted to make oh, her. She, so, she's a, one of those. Yeah. Peter uh, Sylvan has nothing to do with this, but we can get into that once you're ready for the presentation. Right. Where did she so, go? Yeah. She, she could be a panelist. Yeah. Panelist. Yeah. Where did she go? Oh, her name keeps moving around on this. And just take for a second you can find her yeah okay there she is we got her in craig okay uh, i i may have a conflict here all right i do have a conflict here. hi hi, hi craig hi frida <laughs> how are you i'm good thanks how are you good How's All right, so, Mr. Meadows, your office panel. Yes, I am. Okay. Sorry, Frida. That's okay. <laughs> All right, we got four. Um, so for this panel, Mr. White will join the uh, the rest of the members and the panel for tonight's second issue was myself, Mr. White, Mr. Henry, and Mr. Slaughter. Okay. Um, Mr. Reedy, you may proceed. Sure. Thanks. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst, uh, here on behalf of Kutch Woman, LLC. Um, Frida Peters is the manager of that entity, and she's here with me this evening. Uh, Kutch Woman, Frida and her sister, are looking to and pursuing the acquisition of Cushman Market. Uh, it's under agreement. We're working through diligence, financing, et cetera. Um, this is at 491 Pine Street. If folks, if you need me to bring up a map, we can talk about Cushman Market. I assume everyone's familiar with it because it's a staple in the neighborhood and in the community. Uh, so I'm just going to work off that assumption. Um, there is There are a few special permits, but most pertinently, there's a special permit from 2005, um, which allows the use at the property and has 21 conditions. The 21st condition says when there is a change in ownership, the new owner shall submit a management plan to the board for review at a business meeting, which is what we're doing here. The board shall then decide if the new owner will be required to apply for a new special permit. Uh, and so that's that's what we're here to talk to you about this evening. Um, we're on uh, for hearing with the license commission for a transfer of the uh, off-premises liquor license. There's a beer and wine license for this premises. We're on their agenda for June 20th, and then we're looking to close in July. And so from you this evening, what we're here to say is we're not changing a thing at this point. And so we're accepting the existing management plan, the existing conditions. If Frida during her operation says, geez, we need to change X, Y, or Z. We'll talk to the planning department. We'll figure out whether or not they think this warrants some modification. If it does, we'll come back before you in a formal setting. If it doesn't, then we'll just go along and keep operating the way that they have. But at least at this point, and frankly, we don't think anything else is really needed because we're accepting the same management plan that was approved back in 2005 and what's been operating under for the last 19 years and hopefully for the next, you know, pick a number, Frida, X amount more so um <laughs> as simple and and it's, it's as simple as that Frida, do you wish to say anything as peters do you wish to say anything um i don't think so i think tom covered it we really are kind of going in to take over business as usual 
Um, it seems to be running quite well right now. And so we don't really see any need for changes at this time. All right. Just give me, just give us your address, if you would, for the record. Uh, 253 Long Plain Road, and that's in Leverett. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm familiar, I'm familiar with the, the Cushman Market. I've been there several times. It seems to me that the, if you're keeping the exact same um, operation and management plan as was approved in 2005. I don't see a reason that we need to require you to apply for a new special permit. Um, but I'm, I'd like to ask Ms. Brestrup if there's any, uh, if there's any reason to go for a new, uh, for a new special permit. The only reason I can think of is that in the last 20 years, we have done things like required exterior lighting to be downcast and and uh, dark side compliant. There's a few other things that we've done in the past, um, but what's before us today is really just Article 20, uh, Condition 21, when we could approve this without any changes, or we have the ability to say, um, I think the you need a new special permit to deal with um, downcast lighting or other kinds of things that uh, may have changed in the last 20 years. Um, is so what. Is that is that right? That the, the question before us is whether we can have whether we require a new special permit or we just approve the management plan. Yes, that's right. And I uh, I haven't heard anything from the building commissioner or anyone else here in town hall um, that a new special permit is warranted. And as far as I know, um, you know there haven't been complaints about the operation of the Cushman Market. Um, so I would say, in my opinion, that a new special permit is is not necessary but that's of course your decision to make right. any questions from board members comments i just want to make sure i understood correctly this is a simple change of ownership right. okay yep. and the uh, commitment to keep to the same management plan they've had for the last 20 years I'm comfortable with that, and I would yeah. encourage. Yes, Mr. Slover. I'm also comfortable with it, and I have uh, no motivation to needlessly complicate her life <laughs> by doing anything that doesn't make sense. I think there is actually room for common sense now and then. I don't want to get carried <laughs> away, but Cushman Market is a very pleasant place. It seems to be well run, and if the only thing that's changing are the names of the owners. It, this does not seem like a challenge to us. So I support what the chair advocated. All right. Any other comments, Mr. White? Okay. All right. I would entertain a motion that we approve the new management plan uh, pursuant to condition 21 of the 2005 special permit. Do we not need public Chair. comments? What's that? Do we not need public comments if there's any? This is a public meeting, so um, we don't typically take public comments during a public meeting. It's not a hearing. So, um, and that's in order to kind of facilitate the rapid consideration, uh, sp speed through the rapid consideration of, of these kinds of things. And Mr. Slaughter. I think, I think when you asked for the motion just now, I hope I'm not making a mistake that you asked us to approve a new management plan. I think we're, we're approving management. a new ownership. Right. The management plan is not changing, right? Not changing, it's staying. Okay, exactly. okay. Good catch. Okay. So I'll restate the motion. Um, I'd, I'd entertain a motion to approve the new management, the, the new ownership and uh, keeping the same management plan. So moved. Can second. Move, second, moved and seconded. Any discussion? If there's no discussion, the vote occurs on the motion. This requires uh, four votes. So we've got uh, four people. Chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. The vote is four to nothing. Um, motion carries. Congratulations. Good luck. I, Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm, I'm very glad, excited. I'm glad Cushman's going to be sticking around. That's great. I'm glad yeah. you're That's a great place. Yeah. Thank you.
Good luck. Well, I hope to see some of you visiting. We'll be by. You have to. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Early night. Good yeah. job. <laughs> it is an early night. Yep. All right. Um, the next order of business is any is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. So if anybody in the public wishes to speak on a matter that's not before us tonight, please so indicate by using the raised hand function on your uh, on your on the Zoom. I see Miss Moss. His hand is up. Um, bring her on board. Ms. Moss, this is on any matter not before the board tonight. Yeah, this is a, a sort of a little bit of a non sequitur. Could you tell me at at the high at the highest level what were the how many participants would were, were there were zooming in from the public tonight? Typically, we don't respond to public comment, but I can tell you that we're we're in the range of thir of thirty. I'd say twenty five or thirty public comment. Thank people you. People from the public were watching. There wasn't twenty five or thirty public comments. Uh, I mean, how many were watching? Yeah, tw I'd say there were twenty five or thirty. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Any other public comments on matters not before the board tonight? All right. Um, new business um, I really is about the schedule, the upcoming schedule. So I know that next week, next Thursday, we're having an administrative meeting. Um, our rules and regulations require that we do that annually. Chris and I have been talking about um, an agenda. We've come up with an agenda for the for the meeting, which will include an election of officers, kind of an orientation for new members, um, going through several things that we, I think are valuable for them, giving them a chance to ask questions. Uh, we'll also have a review of some of the obligations, open mark, the uh, open meeting requirements and conflict of interest and other things. Uh, and it also gives you a chance to raise questions or issues um, about the ZBA that you may questions you may have in a public setting. So the meeting is scheduled for next week. Uh, we may bring, if we can, we're, we're going to bring in KP Law if they're available to talk through some of the more um, technical issues, legal issues that we have before us. Um, just for your, probably more for the new members' edification, but for everybody's um, edification. Chris, uh, did you have something to say? Oh, I just wanted to mention that I think I got a an email, maybe even during this meeting, saying that um, there will be somebody from KP Law that who's available next week. Um, so yeah. it'll probably be Carolyn Murray, and you all know her from the um, mm -hmm. Ball Lane project, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Mr. Slovater. What what time are you planning on starting that meeting? I, I don't. We'll start I at have six. Six. Yeah. Okay, I had it on my calendar, but I didn't have a time. Yeah, we'll keep and, the same the same time. And do you do you have any sense of how long that meeting will last? It, you know, there's no other business. And so in the past, these administrative meetings have not been very long. I'd say maybe we can make, make it to the break and that would be about it, okay. an hour and a half all perhaps. Right. But, you know, it all depends on the number of questions from probably from the new members. Of course, I just was curious about a general idea. Yep, and there is no action. There's no, aside from the election of officers, there's no action to be taken. Okay, thank you. Yep. It, Mr. Meadows. If, if I get an invitation, I will join you. Um, am I, yeah. But uh, it, it, I will join you as long as the mosquitoes don't come out because I'll be outside and be at a labor in Colombia. <laughs> I, I I don't want to invite the mosquitoes to me. <laughs> okay, we'll make maybe we can get get you an invite and and at the same time send you a, a mosquito netting for your. Thank you. That would be wonderful. <laughs> if we can get it there in a week. Yeah, All we're right. sorry about the mix up earlier tonight. Um, obviously, we've had a change in personnel, and Pam um, Field Sadler has been. Um, what should I say, inviting people to some meetings and Jacinta has been inviting people to some meetings. So it's been a little bit uneven. And so we're going to try to even it out in the future. <laughs> Good luck. It's been, yeah. it's been challenging, but thank goodness we have Jacinta think... who could attend tonight and do this Zoom because uh, it's really, you know, without her, I, I would have been lost. 
I don't do this. Well, Thank I, you all for your help. It all worked out. It all worked out, Jacinta. Thank you. Mr. White, I'm sorry, I talked over you. Oh, no, no, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, I spoke without permission. No, uh, I just thank you guys for everything. I really appreciate it. I know I, I'll speak for everyone else. We uh, obviously couldn't do it without you. So thank you. Okay. Any other questions? And, and after the uh, after the, the the 13th, the next meeting is the, what's it, the tw is it the 20th? 27th. 27th, I think. And at that, we have a carryover from a previous meeting. Is that right? Yes, you have. Um... Ron Laverdier yeah. coming forward with his project at the Amherst Office Park. Yeah. And um, he'll be giving you a presentation and he, I believe he's gonna have his um, engineer with him. Okay, and that deals, and he, that's partially because he needed to deal with the, uh, the grading and the, the fill. Yes, and it turns out he doesn't need an extra special permit for the fill because he's under the threshold, but he can tell you about the amounts of fill that he's proposing to use. And and actually, um, that question caused him to go back and relook at his drawings. And he realized that the drawings that he submitted the first time around were incorrect. And so um, it was actually very beneficial to him to take that second look. And now he's gotten his drawings corrected, and he will be going forward and giving you a very, I'm sure it will be a colorful presentation. <laughs> And we'll have those new drawings available to us before the meeting, right? He'll yes, be that's right. Yep. All right. I have uh, Mr. Slover. I also have a note on my calendar that North Whitney is on the schedule for the 27th. Is that not correct? That is correct. But we've heard from Tom Reedy, who represents the applicant, that he won't be able to attend on that night. And so he's going to ask the board to continue the public hearing to July 11th. Hmm. Ah, oh, and okay. That, so, so North Whitney is moving from June 27 to July 11th. Yes, it will, but you need to vote on June, oh. on June 27th. You need to vote to continue that public hearing to July 11th. Okay. And we already have an email from Mr. Reedy with that um, request. Okay. We may need to look at other dates than the 11th, but we will, I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you on that, Chris, make sure that um, I'd be available on the 11th. Okay. Okay. And right now it's on my schedule, but I, I we have some travel that came up since then. So, all right. We'll, we'll know by the time that we have to make the continuance. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? If not, we're done early tonight. Do you want to know about new business? Oh, yeah. New yes. Um, and Jacinta might be able to explain this better because she's gone over it with Rob Mora. But Jacinta, do you want to say anything about the um, lane quarry application, the special permit application? Um, only that we will have them coming forward bet before the board on July 25th. That's our anticipated meeting date. Um, they are simply looking to renew their special permit. We will be asking to um, asking a few questions of them in the project application report, but it should be pretty straightforward. The expiration date for their special permit is, I believe, August 12th or 14th of this year. So they're just looking to make sure there's no lapse in, um, you know, basically operations. So that is going to come forward um, later in July. That's the quarry? Yes. Is there anything else on the agenda, Ms. Presto? Anything on the, the next 40B? Is that still kind of um, we still we haven't gotten anything back from the state, so we would expect to get something back from the state first, and then um, probably the applicant would have to do some things with their plans, and then they would come. So we're saying, you know, maybe a month um, they would submit something in a month. All right. Okay. Good enough. All right, folks. I've got nothing else. If anybody else does. Speak up or forever hold your peace. All right. I'd entertain a motion that we adjourn. So moved. 
Is there a second? Aye. Motion's moved and seconded. It's not debatable. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Vote is five nothing. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Good and night. we'll see you, see you in a week. Good night. Good night.